The maritime variant being developed for the Navy is capable of hovering. This will be flown by Royal Navy and Royal Air Force pilots off the Queen Elizabeth. It's time for the Bush herself to take a shot. She has one more weapon on board, a close-in weapon system, commonly known as the Sea Whiz. This 20-millimeter Vulcan cannon lives inside a swiveling base almost 15 feet high. In the top of its housing, the Sea Whiz has two antennas. They pick up the incoming threat and direct its fire. In action, it spits out 4,500 rounds a minute each bullet twice as big as the standard U.S. machine guns. It's capable of shooting targets up to five miles away. A day before the bush reaches the Suez, her crew gives the Sea Whiz one last tune-up. During the transit, it will be the bush's last line of defense. Anybody who wants to try and attack the carrier, they're gonna have a pretty rough time getting through here. Uh, we can put a lot of ordnance down real fast. We're ready for anything. The sailors may feel ready, but the question is, are they ready enough? Ready or not, it's time. It's day four of sea trials, and a very special one for Britain's supercarrier HMS Queen Elizabeth. The focus for today, uh, which is a historic one, is the first landing of a helicopter for an 820 squadron on our flight deck. It's the day we become an aircraft carrier. The flight deck teams have been training for this day for nearly two years. First, they must walk the length of the carrier, bigger in area than three football fields, to make sure there is no debris that could damage the aircraft. Fuel contamination in any place taking fuel is lossy. Two helicopters are expected, although right now they're running late. The one thing perhaps I'd bring out is this morning we woke up in what we would call red red, really poor conditions, cloud was on the deck, no visibility whatsoever. We probably wouldn't have been able to fly. The good news about a carrier, it's driven the 70 miles we need to drive, and we're now back into the clearance again, and we've positioned ourselves so that we can fly. The thing that's holding the aircraft up is that bad weather we've just left, so that's why they're late. There is nothing that you haven't done on the flight deck during the last few training serials. It's a walk in the park, okay? We're ready to do this. Everyone happy? Happy. Right, guys, let's do it. What up? Be we safe. Do. Love on air. Yeah. Have we got this aircraft yet? Well done. Yeah. Happy. Have we let them know about seabirds? Hey, Roger, Dodge. The historical problem with seabirds flying close to the ship. We're just monitoring the seabirds. Um, there's not a lot we can do about it other than go a bit faster and hopefully leave them behind. We certainly wouldn't want one of the helicopters flying into a seabird and getting a bird strike because that would cause some mayhem. So it's just something we've got to manage. In old money, we'd have probably got out a shotgun and just let them know we were around, but uh, we can't do that anymore. The seabirds disperse and make way for the first aircraft ever to attempt a landing on the Queen Elizabeth's deck. The flight deck of the supercarrier HMS Queen Elizabeth is about to be christened. Historic moment. Truly momentous day for not only for the supercarrier for the Queen Elizabeth class but for naval aviation. First naval aircraft landing on board the supercarrier. Bloody marvellous. Portent of things to come. Next year it will be jets.
Well, you know, we're four days out from uh, sailing from the builder's yard, and here we are with uh, A20 Naval Escort and arrived, two aircraft, fantastic. The most important part of any aircraft carrier is also the most dangerous, the flight deck. Whoa! <laughs> A floating airfield for warplanes loaded with fuel, bombs, and missiles. The risks are enormous. It's taxi. Computer simulation helps the air crew plan for the worst. Launch the jet. Whoa! <laughs> Maritime aviation at its best. <laughs> Operating at sea is not rocket science, but operating at sea is bloody dangerous. You know, there's a whole load of people who've gone before us who have learnt the hard way as to why you do certain things. I'd be a bloody fool to ignore what our forefathers did. That's nice. There you go. Well, we've solved the problem. It's probably worth just explaining about an airfield. An airfield has a 10,000 foot runway. OK, and we know what's going to happen on the runway. That's where the jets are going to be taking off and landing. But at the same time on that airfield, you're going to have to have a bomb dump. You're going to have to have a fuel dump. You're going to have to somewhere where you're going to house everyone. And there'll be an HQ section. But all of those in a 2,000 acre estate are spread out. You keep the bombs away from the runway. You keep the fuel away from the runway. You keep the fuel away from the accommodation. Our ship, which although the biggest thing the Navy's ever built, compared to this 10,000 foot runway, our ship is there. We've got a metal box. In there, there'll be a magazine. There'll be the fuel. And if you think of the flight deck area and all the armed aircraft up there that are both operating, rearming, refueling, there's a lot of potential risks that we have to manage. Without their own flight deck to train on, the Queen Elizabeth aircraft handlers are practicing on a dummy deck ashore. It's only a third the size of their own, and the old decommissioned Harrier jets can't even fly. But things are moving forward. There will be things we're getting wrong, but they're ultimately, um, this, is, this is our practice. What well, we do it on the deck for real, with the ship manoeuvring, with a bit more sort of operational pressure, we can't afford to get it wrong. So we'll get all our mistakes out of the way here, and then when the real jets turn up, we'll be in a better place. The real jets will be top secret F-35B Lightning stealth fighters. These are still in development and kept strictly under wraps, so none of the deck handlers have ever seen one much less handled one. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm just going to give you a little dip on the uh, fixed wing replica of an F-35B. Life size, it's to scale. Right, so so not an actual F-35, but a life-sized fiberglass model. Eventually, their job will be to maneuver these around the deck and guide the pilots into position. This will give them a feel for the real thing. Compared to a Harrier, didn't realize how big it was. 29-year-old <laughs> Emma Ranson from Liverpool, newly promoted to petty officer, will be the first flight deck leader on the Queen Elizabeth. So this full-sized replica is a glimpse into her own future. 
amazing. I mean, what can you say about it? Just amazing. It's just going to help our training out loads. It's just going to really benefit us as aircraft handlers, moving this around the deck. Just unbelievable. I'm dead excited now. I can't wait just to get it moving. So Emma, with her new toy, now has a much more realistic way of training her team. By April 1975, the situation in Vietnam was very different. American troops had now withdrawn, and the North Vietnamese were poised to take the South's capital, Saigon. U.S. carriers were now involved in a last-minute evacuation of American civilians and South Vietnamese. On April 29th, Midway's crew spotted a small civilian aircraft approaching. They watched as the plane circled and noticed a small package being thrown onto the carrier's flight deck. It was a pistol wrapped in a note. It read, can you move the helicopters to the other side? I can land on your runway. I can fly for one hour more. Please rescue me. Major Buang, wife and five child. Major Buang Lee was a South Vietnamese Air Force officer. The only way Major Buang can land is if the U.S. Navy helicopters on the overcrowded deck are moved out of the way. The Midway's captain didn't hesitate. He ordered several of his helicopters to be pushed off the flight deck and into the sea. About $10 million worth of American air capacity pushed off the deck to, to save this one man and his family. But with the flight deck now cleared, Major Buang still had a problem. His light aircraft was not designed to land on a carrier. It had no tail hook to catch the arresting wire. Plus, there was a strong crosswind. The American onlookers held their breath and watched the Major make a perilous landing. The men of the Midway were so impressed by Major Buang's bravery they started a fund to help him and his family start a new life in the United States. One of the things I've always been fascinated by is engineering innovation. And STEAM is a perfect example of that. It helped us in the Industrial Revolution, and now today on the USS Carl Vinson, we're using it to catapult F-18s off a of flight deck. And through all that, the basic properties of STEAM They've stayed the same. When water is heated into steam, it expands in volume over a thousand times. It's a law of physics that engineers first mastered in the 18th century when they used it to create the piston engine. Over 300 years later, Nimitz engineers are using the same principle on the Carl Vinson. The system that runs it is deep below decks. The start of our steam system all starts right here. Just beneath us is the power plant, and all that steam comes up through this giant duct, and it's actually fed through into our steam fill room right in here, where we've got three control valves to keep that system pressurized at just the right amount. Now, believe it or not, there's three other rooms just like this. What you see here, this is only for catapult number two. The steam for each catapult is stored in two giant cylinders and pistons, each about as long as a football field. The pistons are connected to the catapult shuttle on deck. To launch a plane, the pressure is suddenly released, driving the piston and catapult forwards at 150 miles per hour. There are actually four catapults on board, each has its own engine room and dedicated crew above and below the flight deck. Hey, stand by real quick. Hey, Truman. Hey, can you turn on the throttle tension? What you got? You got 5-0? Uh, okay, go ahead and need a backup, bro. When they get the signal, they fill these pipes with steam and bring it to pressure, arming the catapult. Then they wait for the signal that will shift a 35-ton fighter from standstill to 150 miles an hour in just two and a half seconds. It's a system that leaves no room for error, which is why it gets tested twice a day, every day. In just a few minutes, I'm gonna be able to witness a no load from the catapult. 
is basically when they test the catapult before any day they're doing operations with no load on it. This thing's gonna fly by us at about 150 miles an hour and I get to be two feet away. Pilots' lives depend on this engineering working perfectly, which is why crew go through this routine so carefully. So we're loading up right now, we're bringing back the catapult. This is a safety line, foul line. Everyone's gotta make sure that they're standing behind it and then we're gonna launch this all the way down. some serious engineering. The George H. W. Bush aircraft carrier sails deep within the Arabian Gulf. Seven levels below the flight deck, aviation ordnance men are hard at work. They must build bombs for the day's strike mission against ISIS. All the components will come separately in order to tailor make the different bombs for the different pilots and the different needs that they have. Bombs come in three sizes that can level everything from a sedan to an underground bunker. The smallest are 500 pounds and seven feet when fully assembled. The biggest are nearly 13 feet and weigh almost 2,000 pounds. It takes at least 10 sailors to assemble one bomb. Hope we get on to sail two. Roger. Right now we're building up the GBU-54. This is typically used for a mobile target. For instance, if you have someone in a car that you're trying to defeat, you'll normally use this kind of bomb. The GBU-54 is a type of bomb called a JDAM. That stands for Joint Direct Attack Munition, meaning it's guided by a GPS or a laser lock onto a target. First up, the ordnance team assembles the nose. It contains the laser seeker that allows the bomb to track its target after it's left the plane. Next, they insert the fuse and install the safety switch. These keep the bomb safe on the jet and enable it to detonate upon impact. Without these, a JDAM is just a $20,000 hunk of metal. There is one final ingredient to an AO's recipe for explosive success, the tail kit, a necessary feature that steers the bomb to its target. Pickens and her team know that without their work, the fight against ISIS is a hopeless cause. It is my job to ensure that I'm sending up a quality product to the pilot. I have to make sure that product is gonna go boom when he tells it to go boom. In just a few hours, the team churns out 10 JDAMs for the strike mission and sends the live bombs to the flight deck on one of four weapons elevators. HMS Queen Elizabeth is three months into a four-month deployment off the east coast of America. The F-35s can now launch with weapons for the first time. These weapons are laser and GPS guided weapons, uh, but they're actually concrete. So they've got the real front section, the real aft section, but the actual middle section isn't explosive, it's just concrete. For us as testers, we care about the aerodynamic fall, but what we don't concern ourselves about is whether the, the bomb goes bang. Whizzer, the first to execute an SRVL, will be the first to drop bombs from the Queen Elizabeth. We can just test complete mission to launch the jet. Launch the jet. Tiny left. She comes. Turn 11 9. It's a good axel. Let it be 5 on flight over through. Stores. Jettison downwind. Next bars. 
Wizard lines up for his bomb run, and every move is monitored and measured by civilian scientists. I'm getting permission slowly but surely from the ship to do it on this next pass round. Are yeah, you guys ready? They might be inert bombs that Wizard is carrying, but this is the first time the F 35B has released weapons at sea. The F 35B is about to drop bombs at sea for the first time. The question is will they release successfully? I'm releasing in five, four, three, one. Releasing one, two, Three, four. And all the bombs are away. Looks good here. The fighter jet warship combination is beginning to realize its full lethal potential. That puts us in a very, very sound place to protect ourselves and maintain peace, which ultimately is what it's all about. It's really maintaining the peace. Right? We don't want to use it. I personally don't want to see it used. If it has to be used, oh, I get it. One away, two away. I want it to be seen as the fighter you really don't want to go up against. It's the deterrent to prevent the war and keep the peace. And yeah. that would just be icing on the cake for me. That would be, you know, the cherry on top. That would be perfect. That's where I'd like to be. The USS Bush steams toward the Middle East for a six-month deployment. Her mission, to help ground troops defeat ISIS. On the flight deck, the air wing works to keep their skills fresh and sharp. We start flight operations early in the morning and we go till late in the evening, oftentimes around midnight. The training is intense. Amber Beacon, sir. The most challenging training runs happen at night. 300 airborne. 300 airborne. For security, the bush keeps her deck lights low. The deck crew must use extra caution as they work. And the flight deck is an extremely dangerous environment um, with props and rotors and jet engines turning. The crew uses glow sticks to identify their positions and direct the planes. Some nights, the moon provides extra light. Five, six, ball. Tonight, it's like shooting off into a black hole. Except for the light of the afterburner. Then, there's also the nighttime landing. From the cockpit of an F-18 Super Hornet, the deck looks like this. Well, when you're coming back to an aircraft carrier, particularly at night, it is uh, oftentimes the most intense portion of the flight, and that includes combat flights. As the bush cruises through the Mediterranean, Farrell and the other air wing pilots train around the clock. Soon it will become more than just training runs. Throughout her history, accidents have claimed many. But there is one day when the Enterprise faced her most dire threat. One that nearly destroyed her. January 14th, 1969. The Enterprise is 75 nautical miles from Hawaii, bound for the waters off Vietnam. A rocket explodes on the flight deck, igniting a massive fire. Multiple cameras mounted on the tower and on the deck captured the horrific scene as fuel tanks ignited and more warheads exploded. Flames and smoke engulfed the ship. The blasts from 500-pound bombs exploding on the flight deck tore the ship apart down to the waterline. 
Burning jet fuel spilled down, creating a suffocating inferno above and below deck. In just 20 minutes, more than 340 sailors were injured, many from the flight deck hose teams. 28 men were killed. It is a story told often to those aboard this ship today. Quite often I stand up here and look out and just try to imagine the whole fantail um, and engulfed in flames. Uh, it was some, some heroes that day, without a doubt, yeah, for sure. So I, uh, I've got a lot of respect for the air boss that was here that day and what he had to go against. He sat here and watched those people die, and he's asking people to come back out and get on the, the hoses to put out the fire, pull away the bodies to fight the fire. Well, then there was another explosion, and those people died. So he's up here having to tell people, please get back and fight the fire, fight the fire, because he doesn't want to lose the ship. Rebuilding the Enterprise so she could return to duty took exactly 51 days. HMS Queen Elizabeth. Most of the ship's company remained below deck, living a subterranean existence, an enclosed underground community. Wes, what have you got there, shipmate? All right, sir, how are you? Very well, what do you got there? Uh, cheesecake. Cheesecake? Yeah. Is that high fiber, low cholesterol, slimline cheesecake? Yeah, slimline. Good man, well done. All right. <laughs> Cheers, <sir>. Wes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sometimes you go for days uh, without seeing daylight. Take 1,200 people, put them in, t in the tin box, um, surround them with high explosives ammunition, flammable fuel, running machinery, and then stick it in the middle of the Atlantic and start doing some dangerous stuff like rotary wing flying and fixed wing flying. You have to be um, a special kind of person <laughs> to not get flustered by that. <laughs> With over 225 miles of piping on board, much of it high pressure, flooding is a constant danger. Support party! Front, front, front. Yeah, support party! Front, front. Floods are bad enough, but even worse are fuel leaks. Fire danger, fire danger, fire danger, fire and danger. now, a thousand miles out to sea, a leak of explosive fuel could be the first deadly threat to this maiden voyage. Training kicks in immediately, and damage control teams are on the scene within seconds. This has been a fuel spill through the other side, so um, obviously any fuel anywhere is a fire danger. An aviation fuel pipe has burst. One spark here would be disastrous. Even just the vapors pose a danger. Start cleaning up down there. We start getting that egg, start feeling dizzy, get them out, we're rotating through, yeah? No more than 15 minutes of time in there, yeah? When you start feeling dizzy or nauseous, out that way, all right? So they've managed to stop the flood of fuel. Obviously, the uh, emergency party is still on scene, so if it does flash up again, so for any God forbid reason this set on fire, we can have the team to deal with it. Right. So, yeah, that's... The overwhelming smell of fuel. It stinks, yeah, it's horrendous. Much of the ship is highly automated, but there are some things that still have to be done by hand, or foot. She's a big girl, 65,000 tons, and there are you know, 1,200 plus people on here today. When you actually look at the size of the ship and the amount of people, it's still a big piece of real estate for not that many people to actually get around every day and clean and do firefighting and do first aid party and do their normal jobs. US aircraft carrier of an equivalent size has a ship's company of about 5,000. Yeah. We've got 1,200. Yeah. Just watch your footing as you're coming up the steps, team. It is a building site. There is loads of trip hazards. Right, welcome aboard HMS Queen Elizabeth. The biggest project the Navy has ever been involved in. The biggest ship the Navy has ever built. The Queen Elizabeth is split into 17 decks eight above the flight deck and nine below. She has five miles of passageways and over 3,000 compartments. HMS Queen Elizabeth has been built by a consortium of British engineering companies known as the Aircraft Carrier Alliance. The big difference with this carrier is not so much her technology, but the way she'll be manned. 
An American carrier of a similar size needs 3,000 sailors. The Queen Elizabeth will need less than 700. Called lean manning, this is a revolutionary concept in the world of warships. Well, this is the ship control center. It's a highly automated. The way we describe this is this controls everything from power to poo. And so all the ship's machinery from propulsion, ventilation, electrical distribution, steering is all controlled from here. In a normal cruising state, the machinery for the ship will be operated by just six guys. Six. Lean manning is not just about efficiency. It's also about saving money for a tight defense budget. One of the innovations we've got to keep the manpower costs down is the highly mechanized weapon handling system. A system very similar to an Amazon warehouse. Most of that ammunition is stored in magazines that are right down in the, in the bowels of the ship. And traditionally, that would be manhandled uh, with trolleys from those magazines to the flight deck. On this ship, the ship's crew can press a button, select a weapon, and is automatically transported up from the deep magazine on lifts. So the whole operation is about 30 or 40 guys can do that, where an American carrier to do the same operation is about 10 times as many people. For the sailors yet to move on board, the ship is very much a work in progress. Navigating around it remains a bit of a mystery. Can we get through to five uniform this way? See, do you know the way around now? Yeah, pretty much, I'm getting there. It's a big ship to learn. And it's also, it's also um, a bit like Hogwarts because as things get built and as work's done on board, um, the routes you can take keep changing. So it's almost like the staircases keep moving all the time. I told you, it's like Harry Potter, it's like Hogwarts. Can't go that way today. Go around this way. F-35 Lightning Fighters are the warplane that will eventually launch off the Queen Elizabeth ski jump. And in a top secret location, 3,000 miles away, British pilots are testing the F-35 on an exact replica of the supercarrier's flight deck. This ski jump is, is absolutely representative of our ski jump uh, on Queen Elizabeth, and this is where we've done all of our testing for the last three years. At the end of 2018, Nath Gray will be the first pilot to land an F-35 on HMS Queen Elizabeth. Is it exciting? I don't think there could be any better job in the world. But when we actually put the first wheel, when the, when the rubber hits the deck, and we have that, that capability of carrier strikers delivered back to the United Kingdom that we've missed uh, for the last eight years, um, that, that's going to be a huge moment. The F-35 can fly at well over a thousand miles per hour. Its stealth characteristics make it all but invisible in combat. Currently, one F-35B costs around $122 million and can be armed with short and medium range missiles as well as precision guided bombs. And the maritime variant being developed for the Navy is capable of hovering. This will be flown by Royal Navy and Royal Air Force pilots off the Queen Elizabeth. It is then HMS Queen Elizabeth will finally be battle ready with arguably the most advanced jet fighter ever made. A long way from Commander Dunning in 1917. It's unbelievable, yeah. To, to look, look back at Dunning uh, 100 years ago, to look at the ships he was landing on with the aircraft he was in, compared to our aircraft now and the Queen Elizabeth carrier, I mean, you, you could never have imagined we could make those leaps. And where we'll be again in 100 years' time, who knows? Okay. Let's go. The Queen Elizabeth has been designed around the F-35, the hope being that ship and aircraft will combine to dominate the combat zone as never before. The real strength of the F-35 is its computer intelligence, giving it the ability to absorb and process vast amounts of information instantly. 
This will enable it to second guess enemy intentions and give it overall command of the battle space. It really is the stuff of Star Wars. Whether it's before the mission, so mission planning, whether it's during the mission or whether it's post-mission, the, the carrier's equipped to efficiently soak the aircraft of all the information that it has and then relay that straight away to the next battle space. Here's the conversion. Tower have given me the clearance. We're cleared for the ski jump. We're cleared. Here's the power. Plate release. 